so today I had originally hoped to give you guys a um, um, robotics demonstration, sort of a follow-up on the talk I gave a, a, a year ago, but uh, we have some trouble with Ukrainian bureaucracy and it will be some, uh, some more months until we have all the robotics components to actually build something I can, I can demo you guys. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, code instead of hardware today. Um, and uh, uh, close to my heart, um, a pressing problem I think many of us have, uh, perhaps, um, um, perhaps most of you, perhaps not, will we'll take a show of hands soon. Um, this is the, the outline of the talk today. Um, I'm, oops. The, the um, title of the talk may not be immediately clear. It depends on if you read Fred Brooks. Uh, Fred Brooks talked about silver bullets back in an influential essay in the 1980s. Um, and polyglots I'll explain in a, in a second. Uh, so the, the structure of the talk is very simple. There's a problem I have, maybe many of you have. Um, and I'm looking for a solution. I think I have, I have some solutions. Some of them are a little crazy. I'd like to hear what you guys think about them. And um, then we can see if uh, this can actually uh, solve this problem. And the, the problem or the challenge is that um, back in the day when I started programming at tender age of 11, uh, that's quite a few years ago, um, for some, some time I programmed just in basic uh, probably many of you as well. Sometime, a <coughs> few years, uh, just in C, then C++, uh, then Java, um, let's see, Python was after Java. Um, so it was a language by language and uh, heading in a more productive way, you could say. Um, but that's really not the case anymore today. So first, the definition of a polyglot. A polyglot is uh, just somebody who knows many languages. And... Uh, I think uh, most of us didn't set out to be polyglots in, in programming, but I think we find ourselves in that situation. And uh, this is a nice little chart. You, some of you may have seen this on uh, how to choose a programming language if you're just starting out. Um, I think I got lost right around there. But uh, yeah, there's, there's a few choices. And this is, of course, just a very, very small subset of all the choices. Um, we have. Uh, I counted, uh, for the heck of it, I counted for this talk how many programming languages I programmed during my career or, or life. And it's, it's more than 30 now. Um, of course, I don't use all of those all the time. Some of them were just for fun. But uh, I would say there's a set of about um, 15 uh, that are relevant to me. And I, I hope uh, that's not unusual. So this... Um, so that the talk is of interest. Um, so polyglot programming is a term Neil Ford coined over a decade ago. And he, he like many at the time, they observed that um, um, we, we used to program in these few languages and now suddenly we have this explosion, like a Cambrian explosion. Um, some reasons for this explosion we can speculate at. Uh, some are clear, some are less clear. Another comment from a few years later, James Governor also noting that uh, um, this uh, big ecosystems.net and, and the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, um, they are proliferating a lot of new languages. Uh, the, some, some ideas about why, why this happened. Um, I would say there's also the simple fact that uh, programming, there's a lot more programmers today than there used to be, let's say, 20 years ago. I actually looked for some estimate of how many programmers there are in the world. Um, su surprisingly many, uh, or surprisingly few, depending on your perspective. It seems that uh, nobody really knows, surprise, uh, but a good lower bound is about 20 million. There's at least 20 million programmers in the world. Um, and uh, an upper limit might be, uh, let's call it 100 million. It's somewhere in between. Uh, there's, for example, there's about uh, 40 million GitHub user accounts. And, uh, okay, I, I got 10. A bunch of you probably got 10, but um, in any case, it works out to a few, few 10 million people at least. Uh, let's see, are, are these slides legible? Uh, so given that there are many more programmers, uh, there's going to be necessarily many more languages, many more tools, many more frameworks, libraries, 
and we all have a bigger ecosystem. Um, so that's, that's one reason, but also given that we have uh, many more programmers and many of them are um, young, just entering the field, um, it means that we also have something like a pop culture, uh, a programming popular culture. And we, we see, of course, this, uh, there's a lot of uh, trend hopping from one trendy language to another. Uh, so those are some of the some of the obvious reasons. Uh, then, then of course, uh, simply a lot of us believe these days that uh, um, some tools are more suitable for some problems than than uh, all problems. Um, also, I would say there was a big uh, big reason is uh, things like Ruby on Rails that we had uh, some tools or some frameworks that became so successful that they dragged like a black hole, they dragged everybody into that ecosystem. And uh, Rails is of course the most obvious one. I'm, I'm sure that uh, you all can think of a few more. I would say for example, a Gradle uh, in terms of the JVM ecosystem as a build system. Um, it's the reason why a lot of people know Groovy as a, as a language, because it's written in, in that language. Um, but really the, the major reason is this. Uh, so it happened that all of us, I imagine, really mo most of you as well, we were, we were stuck on poor languages like Java before 8, before Java 8, not very productive. Uh, JavaScript before about 2015, eh, pain in the ass. And, uh, and given, given this, uh, a lot of us tried to, to escape those straight jacket, especially on the JavaScript side. So on the JavaScript side, some people um, doubled down. Uh, they, they doubled the investment into, into JavaScript. And uh, Google, of course, is famous for having, having done this with Rhino and so on back in the day. Um, they run JavaScript on the client side and server side both. That's one option. And of course, after 2015, not so crazy as it was before. Um, and then the rest of us, we didn't really want to develop in JavaScript, so we just output JavaScript and develop in something uh, more productive and fun. The Google Web Toolkit, a uh, bunch of you will remember RJS from the Rails 1 days, I guess. That's a while ago. And then, of course, uh, that space exploded with CoffeeScript, TypeScript, Elm, and, and literally hundreds more. Um, and, and, of course, on the server side, it was the same thing. As I said, uh, Java was... Uh, was definitely not up to par uh, with the competition. So um, all th the quotes I showed earlier from people who were pro proclaiming this poly polyglot revolution, they, they, are from, they are from people who are in the JVM ecosystem and are observing this massive interest in Scala. I mean, I remember this 2008, 2009, massive interest in Scala. I did half a year of Scala myself. And, uh, and then, of course, closure and, and uh, these days, Kotlin and, and so on. So that's that's the why. Um, then, soon enough, a few more years, we have the the skeptics, and uh, and I would say rightfully so, because um, polyglot programming, having to know, let's say, let's, let's actually take a poll. Um, how many of you program in more than two languages per day? Okay, call it maybe a quarter, something like that. What about just two, two languages per day? That should be almost everyone, I would imagine. Okay, all right. Yeah, because everybody, of course, has this uh, client-side and server-side divide, at least, uh, unless you're working entirely, lucky enough to be working entirely in embedded or something else, uh, lots of fun. Um, but yeah, so we have this uh, context switching course between um, switching from one language to another uh, multiple times a day. Um, I have it particularly bad, um, which is why I'm giving a talk about this and why I've been thinking about solutions. So I, I program daily, I would say, four or five languages at least. Um, so for, for work, for, for freelancing, it tends to be uh, Kotlin and, and uh, Java. Um, for, for my own project, it's C++ and OCaml. And uh, then there's a bunch of, uh, let's say, um, minor languages. Like I have a lot of static sites. Uh, a lot of them use PHP because anything else would be overkill. Ten lines of PHP can solve a lot of problems. 
Uh, and then this build systems like Gradle, they have to know some Groovy on a complicated project. Uh, so so this, is, this has been um, sort of fraying me at the edges, this, uh, this uh, um, context switch cost between uh, moving from one language to another. Um, and uh, Tim Bray observed four years ago about the same, that it's getting a little crazy. Um, this would be, let's call it the Node.js heydays. Um, full stack developer is still a term in vogue, I believe. Um, lots of people are looking for full stack developers. Others are offering themselves as a full stack developer. But what does it actually mean? It means that you have uh, crazy cognitive uh, overheads. Um, you are switching between a bunch of entirely unrelated things every day and uh, oh, almost every day. And then it's a good question, how well do you know any one of them? There's an opportunity cost if you're investing in, in these uh, five languages. There's some cost uh, to how much you can invest in every single one of them. Uh, so, so that's the problem space. Um, this, uh, it's clear, clear that there's a trend. I, I tried to find something quantifiable, but um, um, it's mostly anecdotal. Uh, as in, if you look at, let's say, GitHub's uh, language popularity indices or Tayobi or, or any, any, any one of these measures, there's, there's, not a, there's not a lot of comparison of uh, how many languages people use simultaneously. Uh, it's clear that there are more languages over time, and it's clear that there are more programmers. But uh, I, I didn't find any, any, um, anything too quantifiable about it. So I, I, would, I would just uh, um, observe that it, it, the trend seems clear, but I, I can't uh, quantify it at present. Um, so, some of the problems uh, from, from uh, being a polyglot, um, obvious one, of course, is that you got a lot of choices. And uh, humans are very bad at choices. I remember the first time I, I walked into a supermarket in, in America, and I went to choose uh, my toothbrush for, for, for that trip. Whoa, man, that's, that's a hard task. Now, now I know a little bit more about uh, what kind of toothbrush is good and what kind is bad, but... Uh, that was a wall of toothbrushes, and, and uh, I wasn't prepared for that, coming from little old Finland. So this, of course, is the same thing in technology, that uh, we have this continuing trade of analysis of things we hear from our colleagues, uh, things we read in blogs, uh, things we learn through some exploration, research of our own. And, uh, and we're trying to juggle these different uh, badly quantified variables and see what makes sense for the next project. And it's, it's, I think it's a little exhausting. Um, I imagine it's exhausting to a lot of people. And um, uh, then we have something called the Red Queen effect, which of course is that none of us can afford to go on vacation for two years. We come back, it's gonna be a little hard to get up to speed, depending of course on what you work, work on. If you, if you work in embedded development, you've been doing C for the last 20 years, yeah, probably not mu much is gonna change. You'll have a new Clang version, it'll, it'll be good. But uh, if you work in Node.js, whoa, sorry, sorry, that's gonna be tough. Um, so technology doesn't stay still and it takes uh, some effort to just to keep uh, where you are, uh, to keep from sinking. Uh, but really, I think, for me at least, um, with enough languages, the cognitive load is the, is the problem that uh, um, so, as I mentioned, I uh, programming something like uh, almost half a dozen a day, um, on a typical day. But then, then there's a sort of a long, well, not even long tail, a short, short tail of, uh, let's call it 10 more, uh, which I have to work in regularly because uh, I maintain SDKs and the like for, for a bunch of languages. And, and that means that I have, to, I have to keep up with a lot of, uh, lot of details that... Uh, are not relevant to me day to day, but on a week to week basis at least. And um, I would say that uh, in, in my own experience, the costs are proportional um, on the one hand to the quantity of languages, that's obvious, but also of course the quality um, in, in that some languages are very similar and some are actually very uh, different, uh, surprise. Um, and I, I tried to a to little bit uh, illustrate that. So. Uh, this is what I would call the shallow end. You know the joke about the mainstream, right? Uh, the mainstream uh, um, 
the mainstream can't be anything but shallow. Let's see, I actually forgot this joke. It's a bad time to forget it up on stage. Um, why do we call the, the mainstream the mainstream? Because it's too shallow to be, uh, to be a river, something like that. Um, so this is the, the pretty normal, normal kind of um, day, I imagine, for a lot of us. Um, on the front end, in the last few years, after uh, some upgrades to the language, um, I suspect more and more of us are returning back to JavaScript from um, side adventures in TypeScript and, and whatnot. Um, on the server side, so on the, on the client side JavaScript, on the server side, um, there's plenty more languages. Sorry if I didn't include your favorite one. Uh, but these are pretty representative. A lot of us are Rubyists here. A lot of us are interested in Elixir. Um, many of us are working in Go. And, uh, you know, Java is still around. It's going to be around for a while. So it's uh, of some relevance. Um, and then, then we have uh, the situation on, on the mobile uh, end of things. And I imagine how many of you work on mobile apps as well? Whoa. Whoa, me and you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, misjudged the audience. <laughs> I thought there were more mobile developers. Uh, well, in that case, let me tell you. Um, uh, so, we all used to work in either Java or Objective-C uh, to, to deliver on Android and iOS. These days, of course, um, only the crazy ones do that. Um, we have Kotlin and Swift, and both are nicer. And now there's a new entrant, and this is actually Dart. Uh, Dart is... Uh, is um, which is kind of why I'm giving this talk. So, um, Dart is um, it's a language Google has been developing for a long time. It compiles into JavaScript and other target languages. Um, and Google has released a, a cross uh, mobile operating system framework called Flutter, which is actually, um, well, it's a heaven sent for anybody who does mobile. Um, it's um, ridiculously um, productive. I would recommend anybody interested in mobile and who perhaps has been even turned off from mobile previously to, to have a look at that. Uh, Android development is ridiculously painful, uh, whether in Java or Kotlin, and uh, Dart makes it tolerable. Um, and uh, as a side benefit, you can compile for iOS as well. So, so that's sort of the, the, the um, I think a, a lot of people are gonna be um, somewhere here, uh, plus minus uh, two languages. Um, can you shout out some uh, favorite languages that you work with every day that I didn't include here, just so I know? Hmm? Ukrainian. Okay. Yeah, that's that's still one I have in progress. Uh, maybe next maybe next year. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so this is also a little bit of an attempt to to start to um, quantify the cognitive load, as I said. Uh, that uh, what does it mean to switch between uh, these languages on a, on a daily basis, for example? Um, the type system is, is the most obvious one, but also most the most boring. We've all been there, static, dynamic, blah, blah. Not so interesting. Um, then one reason why it was so clear that this is the shallow end is that, oh, look at that. It's almost uniform. We have a little bit snake case here, but uh, other than that, it uh, looks like uh, camel case for classes and uh, lower camel case or mixed case for methods, it's pretty much one. Okay, not my favorite, but uh, tolerable. Um, then if we go to more exotic languages, uh, or at least uh, less, less popular, um, then we have a little bit more variation. So for example, um, in Lisp, we, I couldn't find any other name for it, so I'm just calling it Lisp case. Uh, even Wikipedia doesn't know what to make of it. It's, uh, it's unique. Uh, it's probably my favorite, but uh, it's a little bit impractical in infix languages, as you know. Um, and then we have some, uh, some weirdos, uh, generally speaking. Um, I sort of tried to arrange this that it gets more weird the further down you go. Um, how many of you work in one or more of these languages? quarter, maybe, but very tepid response, so hard to, hard to quantify. Um, so in any case, it takes more, more, some more work be switching between these paradigms. Um, these paradigms are no longer 
exactly um, so so good of a match as 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 here. It's it's not too difficult to switch between these languages, and here it begins to be a bit a uh, bit of a bigger burden. Um, and then, then we can just, uh, if you think about other dimensions of how you would compare the cognitive load of switching between languages, uh, one is obviously syntax, but syntax is not too, too important. Uh, here, this slide doesn't really, sh it's not really about syntax. As you can see, they all pretty much have this uh, algo Pascal-like syntax. Um, it's, it's mostly about uh, to do something very simple like read a text file into a string, um, you have to remember uh, different things on different languages. Ruby, of course, wins this one. It's not, uh, it's not too bad. Um, uh, Java, before eight, well, I couldn't fit it on the slide, so <laughs> uh, I, left, I left it out. Um, but then I think the real problem, um, you know, you can manage uh, sort of this uh, different paradigms, different syntaxes, different naming conventions. Uh, you can even kind of remember uh, more or less the different standard libraries and where to find what, and you have documentation. But actually, that's where the trouble starts. So just to look up the documentation for your language you happen to be working in at the moment, uh, so again, if it's more than two, um, two you can keep bookmarked in front of you. If it's more than a few, then um, you gotta start rem remembering how do you find the documentation for the standard library in that language. Um, and that can, well, that, that needs a good use of bookmarks, clearly. But then, past that, we have other things. Package managers. Almost every language has a different one. And uh, in some cases, uh, we get away with, uh, in some ecosystems, we get away with the same ones, but even then we have two choices. Uh, test frameworks. Oh, these go in and out of fashion. Uh, those are some of the ones I use. Uh, for Swift, I don't actually do anything with the other languages I work with, so this, this, uh, this uh, came from Googling. Um, code coverage. If you want to integrate with Travis CI, uh, depending on your project. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to be a good coder and, and generate some documentation for your <coughs> co colleagues to use your APIs, uh, well, there's a bunch of different uh, tools and syntaxes to remember. So I think this is where things start a little bit, at least for me, uh, freeing at the edges, that it's, uh, it's just a lot of, uh, lot of things to keep track of um, if, if you have to work with more than a few languages. And uh, so, as you can see, that's what I do. I, I make uh, notes for myself, like in the movie Memento, but it doesn't have to be backwards. Table, table will suffice. I have these big tables on, uh, if I don't work with a language for half a year, I'll remember where I need to go look when I come back. Uh, talking about solutions, probably um, it's pretty clear that um, a typical solution that um, maybe um, a lot of people would do is uh, code generation if you, if you have to target a lot of languages. It's, it's essentially what um, a lot of these uh, languages I showed you already do. So with Dart, it's gonna um, target, for example, JavaScript if you're gonna run it in the browser. Uh, with Go, it used to generate C code. Um, don't know what they do these days, maybe they have something past that. And um, from, from a lot of these languages, we can get JavaScript out, for example, as, as, as one solution. So I've been, as a one avenue of solution, I've been exploring the code generation space. And of course, here we have to start by acknowledging our um, ancestors and uh, the great things they've, they've done. How many of you have programmed in Lisp? Whoa, I need to talk to you. <laughs> okay, okay, so Lisp, Lisp is, uh, um, Lisp is, uh, in, in this context, it's relevant because in Lisp we do runtime code generation. So basically macro expansion generates the code that you don't want to write, and that's pretty cool. Um, but Lisp is not very relevant for, for most of us, and uh, um, I'll just uh, pay honor to, to this, uh, pay homage to this uh, um, community and, and move on. Uh, one more quote from this community. I object to doing things that computers can do by a, a famous... Uh, a grumpy old Lisper. Um, so that's a lot of information, but uh, code generation is probably familiar to, to most people in um, a few different um, um, aspects. Obviously, JavaScript generation has been in vogue for the last five years or so, longer. Um, but beyond that, it's also lexing and parsing 
very few of us uh, would implement some syntax by hand anymore. There's a lot of uh, buzzer generators and, and other tools to help us. Um, how many have used uh, Avro uh, protocol buffers thrift sometime in their career? Okay, not too many. Um, and then of course we have Swig for interfacing to to lower level libraries like Qt from, if you want to write a desktop app in Python or Ruby, you probably go through bindings generated by Swift, uh, Swig. Uh, so code generation is, um, is already used in a lot of places, but it's by no means something uh, um, too, too many of us are familiar with. So the thing is though that with code generation you can, uh, you can achieve a force multiplier. Uh, so it would be, in some situations it would be crazy to write the resulting code by hand. Um, a project that uh, I'll talk about um, towards the end of the talk is, is, is like that. If I wrote it by hand, it'd take me 10 years. Uh, so it's better to, to try and find some way to generate it. Um, and another thing I came, came across um, in beginning to dig into what the solutions might be for this kind of uh, um, cognitive uh, um, challenge uh, is something called model-oriented programming. Anybody heard of this? I wasn't too familiar with this. Nope. Okay. So MOP, uh, it's coined by, um, you probably know this guy. He's the guy who wrote Zero MQ. Uh, recently passed away, sadly. Um, but he, before Zero MQ, he's known for, um, for MOP and uh, a few things I'll get to. So MOP is just um, making a paradigm out of code generation. Uh, so combining uh, strong semantics with code generation, a strong modeling with code generation. And um, what he, he talks about in um, his introductory uh, MOP tutorial, um, we all know something about this. Um, we prefer writing make files or the equivalents in 100 languages uh, instead of writing uh, bash scripts that do things explicitly. It would be a lot of work to, to build a build system out of raw bash scripts when we can have some dependency tracking and higher level abstractions and, and semantics. We prefer writing um, declarative documents and uh, attached styles instead of writing something like PostScript, which is actually an uh, imperative language for drawing things on the screen. And uh, we can generate PostScript from PDFs or, or HTML. Um, it would be crazy to write that PostScript by hand. People used to do it in the 80s. Um, and of course, we are familiar with um, um, moving up from the assertion level testing to something that feels more like writing requirements, behavior driven development, as it's usually known. Uh, so, some of these kind of things are already familiar. MOP is about generalizing this. So, instead of um, um, applying this in narrow areas that happen to be handed to you, how about? Um, making this a paradigm that uh, um, forms an integral part of your work, depending of course on what kind of work. Uh, it's not uh, relevant to all, all things. Um, and, and of course it's uh, related to metaprogramming, declarative programming, and DSLs. Um, things that all of us in the Ruby community are pretty familiar with. Uh, so in, in particular to the Ruby community, this should be no, no shock as a, as a paradigm. Um, now, one important aspect from, if you, if you guys are old enough to remember, in the 1990s there was this craze in the enterprise around the UML diagrams, modeling, um, and then the idea was to generate, for example, Java code from this. And that all crashed and burned, um, and, and one reason is that they tried to do everything. They tried to, to uh, model anything possible, and uh, that doesn't really work. It's better to, to um, be flexible in being able to quickly build new modeling languages that fit your problem at hand. So that's of course uh, very close to the idea of DSLs, that you, you design a language up towards the problem so that you can express your solution directly at the uh, conceptual boundary with your problem. And uh, that means that we need technologies to quickly build something like a modeling language. Um, now in, in Ruby we have this uh, ability to to do syntactic abstraction, and that's very helpful. Our, our spec is a, a result, for example. But uh, the, the wider point is that if you, 
if you work on this declarative level instead of down on the imperative level, um, you can survive technology changes. Like our, our industry is very, very much uh, driven by um, short-term thinking. Um, it's understandable if you have to deliver something. Uh, it doesn't matter what it takes, deliver it. But uh, it, it leads to this problem that a lot of the work we do, it doesn't really have any value as a long-term investment. Um, those of us who are lucky enough to work with uh, some, some part of our work is open source. That's of course exactly that, you're investing into the long term. You're usually you're going to have a higher quality level for your open source work than for your um, ordinary uh, day job. And uh, no wonder, because you, you'll, be, you'll be using it uh, for years to come and you hope a thousand other people will be using it. So it makes sense to invest into it more. And uh, that's sort of uh, Peter Hinton's point with MOP that um, it doesn't matter, his, his, he had been doing it for 25 years, it doesn't matter what operating systems come and go, it doesn't matter what languages come and go, uh, he can always just push a button and generate for, for a new target. And he wrote um, something you can find on GitHub called GSL. So it's a code construction um, tool, uh, code generation, of, how did you put it, a universal code generator. Uh, I think it's the only one of its kind, if you don't include um, uh, things like um, templating languages, which are much more restricted in power, um, and if you don't include things like Lisp, where the output is never visible to you, it happens at runtime. Um, so he has a nice quote here, magic is simply technology that is 20 years ahead of its time. Um, it seems it remains 20 years ahead of, ahead of its time. Um, so he, before Zero MQ, um, what he was known for was Open AMQ. So he, was, uh, he wrote the AMQP spec before 1.0. 1.0 went a little bit in a different direction with the rabbit guys. Um, and uh, this implementation for, for the server, for the reference implementation of a AMQP uh, 09, uh, it was fully code generated. Something like 99% uh, was code generated from 60,000 lines of uh, specification. And so using his own tools, this GSL and uh, and just uh, a lot of modeling. So that's, that's one, one unusual way to do it, but it also means that then you can um, maybe make some guarantees about the re end result. Uh, if it really takes, and in C maybe it will take, if it takes half a million lines of code to write a server like this, 60,000 is a good saving. Um, it's a good uh, compression ratio of almost, uh, almost 10 to one. Um, and also in terms of defect density, how many bugs would you have in uh, handwritten half a million lines of code versus a conceptual model that takes uh, 60,000 lines to specify? Um, of course, your code generator might have some, some bugs as well, but uh, that means that you, you can fix those in the generator and the output, um, you, you might fix 100 bugs in the output by f fixing one line in the generator. So there's this amplification effect. So an unusual way to proceed, but uh, I find an, an interesting one. Um, and uh, I would recommend reading this model-oriented programming, even, even if it um, isn't something you can apply. It's at least uh, some, some novel ideas of people who went entirely a different way in, in terms of uh, uh, delivering things. And the thing that he's proud of is, um, uh, first of all, that uh, when he worked with customers, he was always able to, to turn around things much quicker than anybody could expect, because for him it was a small change in the model and pressing a button and out comes a, a new version of the program. And uh, in some cases he was able to say that uh, there's not gonna be any bugs in this uh, resulting code, uh, which is not something any of us can claim, no matter how many uh, unit tests we, we write for our code. Um, and that leads me to the something crazy part. So I'm, I've had this pain point for a while and I wasn't exactly sure what to do about it. I've been uh, exploring these different uh, solutions people have done and it's obvious some kind of code generation is part of the answer. Um, but it's, it's, it's um, I think it takes more than that. Um, I think I would like something like this. I, I would like for there to exist a universal standard library uh, as a thin shim across um, various programming languages 
that basically just uh, maps from, from a, let's call it a, a, a universal subset of what all these languages are capable of. Every, every one of them has a string type, every one of them has a substring operation, and, and so on. Uh, maps a common operation specified in a, in a high level of abstraction um, with, a, with a naming structure that's consistent across all these languages, maps that to the, the um, standard library operation of a particular target language. And I, I, I realize this is pretty uh, crazy, uh, or depending on your point of view, maybe even stupid. Um, this, this, um, this is exactly the kind of idea that a lot of us have had in the shower, and then, no, it could never work. And, and the, the reasons for why it could never work are, are clear enough. Um, no need to, to berate me with them. But I think it might actually work. And, um, and now, we actually, there's a nice uh, piece of terminology from um, JavaScript, uh, the idea of pol polyfills. So suppose that we had something like this uh, common interface. Let's not, let's not call it universal. That's too ambitious. A common interface. And uh, let's suppose that some, some target language lacked some facility. Um, the notion of polyfill is pretty much um, exactly what's needed there. So in that case, the, the implementation of this uh, shim would provide some missing piece that is not available in the target language. Um, a nice example being, for example, UTF-8 in, in JVM languages. It's been a bit of a pain point. Um, Java was standardized before it was clear that uh, uh, UTF-16 wasn't going to cut it, and uh, it's been a pain point ever since. Now, so entertain this idea for a, for a moment. It's, um, I think it's uh, clear that it has a lot of uh, challenges, obstacles. Um, it's in some ways, it's downright idiotic. But entertain it for a, for a second and consider if, if this could be done uh, what, what are some of the benefits one might gain, uh, other than this uh, um, being able to, to a little bit remember uh, when you switch between languages where things are going to be in the standard library. Uh, one, one possibility would be, for example, that uh, there's a lot of design mistakes in, uh, in programming languages we use today, as well as um, standard libraries that can't be corrected because of backwards compatibility, or at least they are very, very hard to correct. Uh, this uh, example of the 16-bit um, character in Java is, is, is an obvious one, but there's also many worse ones, uh, such as most famously perhaps null safety. In, um, in modern languages on the JVM, um, for example Kotlin, um, you have to opt into using nulls. You have to opt into using mutability. So it's the polar opposite of, uh, of Java. And this is going to be the case with pretty much all of our modern languages. Uh, because we, we, we found that the old way of doing it, it was deficient, uh, has, has a higher risk factor. And uh, some examples I'll get to. Safe arithmetic would be nice too. It would be nice when you add two numbers that the result could be something you could count on. And I imagine a lot of you know it's not really the case in a lot of languages we use. Um, other things, if we were to make a wish list, um, I wondered. Uh, as I begin to work more and more with the real world through robotics and, and smart hardware, um, why don't we have any data types in standard libraries for representing real world objects? Um, it's, it's, um, it's probably exactly because uh, in the 1990s, the Audis, um, we, we dealt mostly with uh, virtual products, with virtual problems. And it's only now that we, we are beginning to, uh, for example, we have a mapping ability in mobile, mobile phones and mobile apps, and we have to care about, for example, latitudes and longitudes. Before we had, everybody had a mobile with GPS and apps for it. Um, latitudes and longitudes would have been for GIS people, geographic information systems. And now we all have to care about it if we have any kind of app that touches the real world and touches mapping. But there's a lot of other things missing, and uh, I would just mention that um, I'm sure a lot of you have used UUIDs, pretty useful, um, but they are missing in, for example, even Ruby. We have what was it, two competing UUID libraries, and uh, it's very annoying when you have a dependency which uses one or the other, and then you have to convert between them. It doesn't make sense. It should be pushed down to the language. 
Um, URIs, well, those we have. But even things like ISBNs, um, it's, it's definitely something that a standard library might provide. Um, one very, very cool demo I would recommend watching is uh, Wolfram language uh, from uh, uh, Stephen Wolfram, uh, author of Mathematica. Uh, he has, in, in the slides, there, there's a link to a demo uh, that in 10 minutes shows um, what programming could be like in 20 years. He has, he has basically a language, a runtime, and a standard library that is literally 20 years in the future. It's, uh, it's a mind-blowing demo. It, this this uh, language and this library, it knows about the real world. You can, you can, um, you can do trivial, trivially do things that would be very complicated for any of us to do with our favorite languages. Uh, for example, let's say that you wanted to just uh, um, take um, um, the flags for all the countries in the Middle East and analyze um, the color spectrum from these flags. It's like a one-liner in, in this uh, language. It's got all this stuff built into the, the language. It's very impressive. Uh, so this is sort of a um, green fielding. And yes, it's, it's, it's clear what the um, downsides of such dreaming is. I, I know, but let me dream with you. So some reasons for why this might be useful are clear. For example, lowering this cognitive load of anybody who deals with other languages. Uh, lowering the cost of learning a new language, uh, if it has this library available for it. Those are clear. But there's also some more important things, actually. And um, so as I mentioned, uh, null safety. Um, we've all come to see the light on this. Um, null is one of the worst ideas ever put into a programming language. And the uh, author admits the original sin in this regard. Um, null should not be part of the repertoire of what we program with. Um, another thing is that, um, especially in a lot of C programs and uh, a lot of um, programs in languages that don't have a good standard library, there's just this endless reinvention of the wheel going on. Um, so if you think about JavaScript a few years ago, or even, even today, uh, without any any uh, crypto, uh, without any um, big integers, big nums, um, without even reliable integers, uh, it's pretty hard to do the things that you need to do, um, and it means that uh, there's a there's a thousand different uh, big num libraries for for JavaScript, and then a thousand dubious quality uh, cryptographic libraries on top of those, and uh, none of it talks to to uh, each other, none of it interoperates. And this, this, uh, something like this was already recognized a long time ago that when, when a language doesn't have um, careful design, um, you, you end up uh, with a lot of um, wasted effort in the world. And maybe the, the most obvious example is uh, what's known as the numerical tower. So this is a, a concept uh, from Scheme, Common Lisp, um, languages like that, and actually also, also Ruby, because Ruby, of course, has some Lisp heritage, uh, through small talk at least. And um, this is how one might hope that your numerics library in your standard library would look like. You would hope that uh, integers, rationals, reals, and complex, uh, uh, complex numbers of any size can be represented, can be um, added together, multiplied together, you would hope that uh, you will not have an integer overflow and you can do whatever computations you need to do safely. Uh, that's not the case with most languages today. And there's an egregious, of course Ruby, Ruby is very good in this regard, so you know, that's, that's an example to other languages. But not all languages are that good. And um, PHP and JavaScript, of course, are the most famous for being absurd. Uh, there's really no other word for it. It's, it's absurd. And uh, PHP has fixed a lot of these um, things in PHP 7 and, and, and uh, earlier. But for example, I ran this today on, uh, on PHP 7 on my, on my laptop, and sure enough, it still gives true. Can you believe it? It's the absurd. It's, it's the only word. And. Um, and you can't even, you can't even uh, write reliable code in PHP 
uh, numerics code because of it, because you don't know the necessarily the size of your integer. You gotta always be checking, are you on 32-bit or 64-bit? Your code is gonna be pretty random how, how it's gonna work. And, uh, and it comes from uh, KLS design. PHP is maybe the most famous language that just organically grew in every which direction. And hey, I, I still use PHP, but you know, it's 10-liners for uh, doing some very easy things. Not, uh, nothing mission critical. And uh, for people who do try to use PHP for something mission critical, well, it can be a hard time. And uh, not just a hard time for, for you, but a hard time for your customers. This is an example, I don't know how famous, but uh, I, I was tracking it at the time, five years ago. So there was a Bitcoin exchange, the biggest in Europe, called Bitcoin24. So Mount, Mount Gox was the largest internationally, and of course you know that they imploded as well. Uh, but uh, in, in Europe it was Bitcoin24, and um, people started having a few concerns about it, what, what was going on, and rightly so. Um, this is the owner and creator of Bitcoin24 posting on Stack Overflow about some missing money. And sure enough, exactly what you would expect will happen, did happen. It's, 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 it's no surprise. It's what should happen. Um, so millions, millions uh, were bled out from the exchange uh, because he represented money, currency as floating point numbers. Good job. Um, yeah, so that's, that's an example of um, uh, the reliability level of software written using a poor level of abstraction in a poorly designed language with a standard library that doesn't give you any help. And it's hardly the only example. Uh, I'll quickly go through a few, few others. Uh, so that was five years ago. That, that never stopped. This is this year. Um, now, this is a bunch of different uh, bugs that caused this half a billion dollars loss in the last, what is it, call it a year. Um, but some of those bugs are similar. And then, of course, we have some very famous ones um, that happen because uh, language is poorly represented, um, the operations they were going to, to do. So very famously, in 1998, NASA lost the spacecraft to Mars. It crashed into the atmosphere, boom. And the reason is that the contractor used um, American imperial units uh, of pound force per second. What, what is that even? Uh, instead of the, what they should have used, the Newton seconds. And you can see how this error can happen with the current level of abstraction we usually work with. It's, there's a floating point number, there's a floating point number, you put them together, oh, they didn't have the same unit. Well, too bad. You know, we're gonna crash into the atmosphere. And, oops, I think I skipped one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the other one that's uh, very famous, um, I used to work in the space industry a little bit with the European Space Agency, so this were of interest back in the day. So 1996, um, the Ariane rocket, which had a perfect track record, never blew up. Well, that, that track, track record ended because they had an integer overflow. So the, the, see the thing was that Ariane 5 was new, uh, but they used all the, the uh, software from Ariane 4. But the problem is that Ariane 5 had higher trust. So it meant that this 164-bit um, um, floating point number had a larger value than they expected um, because the rocket was going faster. And it was just over some little threshold and as a result, kaboom. So, this is, uh, this is like a few lines of code and uh, big, big trouble. Um, and one of the uh, famous quotes, I know uh, you all know it, uh, Brian Kernigan, that we often, if we work at the limit of our ability, we are often not smart enough to be able to troubleshoot what we created. Um, and if, if that's the case, I mean, it's a hypothesis, then um, it really doesn't help us a lot to, to have these impediments like uh, working, working without any semantics in our, in our numerics. So no units attached, 
but not, not, not only no units attached, no, no reliable arith arithmetic even. Uh, integer overflows, uh, silent coercions, it's, it's, it's a catastrophe, uh, literally in some cases. And, and so just to, to close, um, there's this notion of a silver bullet. You know, a silver bullet can kill a werewolf uh, or a vampire or something like that. Uh, silver used to be cool. And um, Fred Brooks um, of the Mythical Man Month, he, he wrote a follow-up essay called No Silver Bullet. And he, it's a great essay to read for every, every software uh, engineer, I would say. Any, anybody who, who wants to, to try to do engineering instead of random hacking, uh, this is a great one to read. Um, he distinguishes between two kinds of complexity that plague us in software. So he distinguishes between essential complexity. That's the, the actual meat of your problem. Um, you're trying to solve, solve something and it can't be solved any simpler than the essential, um, essential problem that it is. So as Einstein said, uh, um, simple but no, no simpler. And then there's accidental complexity. And this is what we are plagued with in, uh, in programming. So these examples I showed you, they're examples of accidental complexity that they, um, people working with bad abstractions will have bad results some of the time. It's, it's no surprise. And uh, can, can that be remedied? Well, it's one of the questions that came up as I started exploring this direction of uh, how to target 10, 15 different languages with something I wanna publish. And uh, um, Fred Brooks is essentially repeating Peter Hintons' point here that um, it's about the specification design and testing of the conceptual construct of the, of the model. Uh, that should be correct. And the rest, well, the rest we can co-generate. And that's the road I'm embarking on to see if it's true. So, thank you. It's exactly as you said, uh, it's uh, the option type. Uh, yeah, so for example, in, in uh, OCaml, you can't represent a null. Uh, instead, if, if a function could return a value, uh, and in some cases can't give you a value, the result is wrapped in an option, and the type system requires you to check uh, before using the value. And Java also gained this now in recent versions. So a lot of these concepts are being backported even into these legacy languages. Right, I mean, null, null, is, um, null is always a surprise, an unpleasant surprise. And um, um, we, we have to get rid of that surprise. And, and so in, in OCaml, null is not a problem, and you don't have to think about it, and everything s flows smoothly. It's the same in, in uh, newer languages like, like Swift, and, and uh, as I said, even into Java, it was backported. But the APIs remain in Java, the thousands and thousands of APIs, they remain non-null safe, so null unsafe. And, and that's a problem. So you have this facility now, but it's not gonna fix the existing legacy code, and it can't. Yeah. Uh, for which, which part of the uh, problem space? I, I don't think you should um, um, want to be a polyglot because if, if you have a, 
if you have a situation where you don't need so many languages, then it makes more sense to invest into some specific good languages. Uh, I'm sort of forced by necessity to, for example, because I maintain these different software development kits for a bunch of languages for some, some projects, I'm forced to know languages I don't otherwise have an interest in. And, and that's, that's why uh, these things are of concern to me. But if, you, if you're lucky enough that you can uh, work in a space where you're working in a nice language, you like it, everything is good, stick with it. Um, and if you want to adopt a new language, adopt it for, for its sake. I don't think uh, it's any goal onto itself to be a poly polyglot. It's more of an accidental feature of the modern landscape. They won't. <laughs> they won't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in in my case, I'm I'm exploring this space by um, a, a Lisp-like language that I feed into my code generator, and then I get uh, something like a universal standard library shim out into all the target languages I care about. Um, and without doubt, that's not the syntax that most people would uh, love. Um, but I don't think there's a solution to that because. Um, you know, ultimately, ultimately, there's a lot of trade-offs in, in the syntax space. Um, and if you're going to do code generation, something like a Lisp syntax makes sense. But that's a long argument to make. And uh, I, I wouldn't expect uh, most people to even have the patience to listen to that argument. And that's OK. They can use the end results. They don't have to necessarily use the, the sort of upstream uh, that uh, flows into these specific target languages. It's OK. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. so transpiler is the word people like to use these days. Um, it, it depends on, on what you're doing. For example, it probably was a good idea 10, 12 years ago for, for Rails to, to use um, RJS um, to generate some, some minimal JavaScript that was needed at the time. But then Ajax happened. And then suddenly all of us had to care about JavaScript a lot more than we <laughs> wanted to. Uh, and. Uh, you know, at that point, the code generator can't save us anymore um, because uh, compiling all of Ruby into JavaScript, uh, there's, there's, there's many projects that try to do things like that, but uh, that's a very ambitious project uh, because Ruby isn't meant to run in JavaScript. And maybe some subset can be made to run, but maybe you should just write JavaScript in that case. Uh, so I, I, I don't think there's a general answer to that question, if you need it. <coughs> 